I send a message to the CEO of our competitors saying, basically, I built a competitor. It was shit, but we have a blog and some traffic. Maybe you could be interested in buying it. Hello and welcome to Indie Bites, the podcast where I bring you stories of fellow indie hackers in 15 minutes or less. Today, I'm joined by Pierre de Wolf, who's the co-founder of Scraping Bee, a web scraping API that grew to a million dollars in ARR in just two years. Before starting Scraping Bee, Pierre and his co-founder Kevin had quit their jobs to follow their indie dream. Nine months later, their product pricing bot couldn't quite generate the traction they were hoping for, and so they sold the business and pivoted to Scraping Bee. Now, Pierre talks multiple times about how effective SEO has been for his projects, which is why Ahrefs is a perfect sponsor for this episode, as you'll be able to implement the advice you hear immediately. Here's what our guest today thinks about SEO. In the early days, you have time, but no money. And so for this reason, SEO is like the perfect acquisition channel. So Indie Hackers, if you want to get more traffic to your side project, give Ahrefs a go. You'll be able to see what keywords your pages are ranking for and discover what changes you need to make to improve your search ranking. And if you don't know where to start with SEO, take a look at their YouTube channel. It is fantastic. Head to ahrefs.com slash A-W-T. That's A-H-R-E-F-S dot com or hit the link in the show notes. Let's get into this episode. Pierre, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, James. Good to have you. Now, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about you because I don't know much about your background, what you did when you were growing up. Did you grow up in France? Did you have any entrepreneurial influences around you? Did you sell T-shirts for your school or stickers or trading cards, whatever the entrepreneurial stuff kids do? I grew up uh, yeah, in France. My father was kind of a freelance in a time where we didn't call that freelance. Yeah. He was choosing his own hour and I think it was always a kind of inspiration. I mean, for me, it was normal. My first entrepreneur experience was actually on World of Warcraft. You had to farm, like to work a lot to get those gold coin. <laughs> and I realized that it was much easier to make others work for you. That was quite fun to, to just accumulate all those gold coin that I didn't choose at all because I was not a hardcore player. But I had a lot of fun doing it. I did it with Kevin, which is my current co-founder, but this was also probably our first adventure. Were you making actual money for this or was, it, was this just online, like in-game currency? Yeah, it was just online money. <laughs> we probably could have sold it, but it was just fun to try to be like the, as rich as possible. That was probably the first startup endeavor of my life. I love that. Are you, where did you and Kevin meet? Uh, in high school, actually, and we were more interested in World of Warcraft than mathematics. <laughs> so that's how we got along and learned to know each other. Okay, so, so tell me about Pricing Bot and starting this out with Kevin. Yeah. Was it something that you discussed? Have you tried like other projects while you were working your jobs? Or was just this something you thought, we're going to work together, we're going to try and quit our jobs? Or did you quit your job and then start Pricing Bot? We always wanted to build something together. We tried a lot of things. We tried to build actually a poker statistic tracking tools at some point. And in Christmas 2016, my girlfriend wanted a tool to monitor the price of product she wanted mm -hmm. to buy online. And so this sounded like the perfect small project to build. So at that time, we were both working full time on our own job. And that's actually the first real product we did together. So it was called shop to list price monitoring extension. You would add your product, receive an email as soon as the price drops. And it worked quite well. We managed to get thousands of user, but we made no money at all from it. And so we couldn't <laughs> quit our job and focus on this because yeah. we need 200,000 monthly active users to make $10,000 per month. But we noticed that our biggest users were actually e-commerce owners uh, spying on their competitors' products. And so we thought, okay, here there may be something we can do. It's probably going to be much easier to sell a product to e-commerce owners. So we thought, okay, let's target those uh, Shopify dropshippers, whatever. And we built it. Before building it, I quit my job because I wanted to go all in. Retrospectively, do you think that was a good decision to leave your job? Was it a case of, we don't think we can make this work as a side project. We've got to quit our jobs for it. So to put things in context, I am in France. And so I had the chance to have some kind of agreement with my employer. And so when I left the job, 
I had one year of unemployment benefit. So mm. this changed things a lot because I could leave my job, fail with pricing bot, and I would have this monthly unemployment benefit to bring food to my mouth, basically. Yeah, I don't regret quitting. I think you need a lot of time to focus on a new project, but I probably wouldn't have done it without this unemployment benefit that I was lucky enough to get. Talk me through why you stopped working on pricing bot and ended up selling it. We quickly knew that first, the target was wrong. Dropshippers, they don't care about competitor price. It's a whole different business model. Secondly, we knew nothing about e-commerce. And so it showed when we talked to e-commerce owners. Thirdly, we didn't manage to find a, an acquisition channel that worked. We did a bit of SEO, which brought some traffic, but it didn't convert at all. Mm. Like they were as really a, a misfit between audience, product, solution. So when we noticed it, that we need to, to rebuild the whole thing to make it work. Instead, we tried to pivot to, to something else. And you ended up selling pricing bot. How did you manage to sell something that wasn't working? And did you have revenue at this point? Was it like a couple of hundred? Was it a couple of thousand? It, it was a couple of hundred, like $600 MRR. So our product was worthless, but we have some good traffic. We were ranking first for price monitoring tool, which was a very expensive keyword on Google Ads. And so I just went on LinkedIn. I sent a message to the CEO of our competitors saying, basically, I'm here. I built a competitor. It was shit. It didn't work, but we have a blog and some traffic. Maybe you could be interested in buying it. And it worked. And the second one agreed to buy us for, yeah, low five figures. But at that time, it was very big for us. And it, it would give us time to build another product. Amazing that you did that. Do you think that's a route that other founders should go if they build a project that hasn't got the traction they need to maybe try and sell off some yeah. of those assets? Yeah, yeah I, I think if you have organic traffic, it has value and it's very easy to estimate the value of the organic traffic. You just go on Ahrefs and it gives you a rough idea of how much your website is worth. I, I know if a web scraping API, a competitor with good articles and good traffic who send me this kind of message, I would be interested in acquiring it because good content and quality organic traffic is worth a lot. 100%. And funnily enough, Ahrefs are actually the sponsor of this episode. So it's fun that you mentioned them. And ah, well, I love Ahrefs. How do founders approach SEO? What do they have to do? Everyone wants this, this organic traffic that will just grow and build over time. If someone knows nothing about SEO, where should they start with it, Pierre? It takes a lot of time in the beginning, but it's true that, especially as a bootstrapper, in the early days, you have time, but no money. And so for this reason, SEO is like the perfect acquisition channel. It compounds over time. But it's very slow to bootstrap. I'd say first, don't try to do SEO. Just try to write content and good content. Don't do SEO because you, you feel like it's a new discipline you need to learn and it's uh, lots of tweaks and tools you need to master. I know it because we did it three times with Kevin. So Kevin did it one time with his web scraping blog and it was just very good content shared on, in, on the internet, no optimization. No keyword research, no link building, no whatever. We did it with pricing, but same. We just tried to write the best possible content about e-commerce and we did it with scraping B. So in the early days, don't try to do SEO, try to write good content. Let's circle back a little bit to starting scraping B. So you'd sold pricing bot. When did you come up with this idea to make this web scraping API? Actually, we use the web scraping API when building pricing bot. Mm -hmm. And that's what's Web Scraping API had some success, we knew it, but it was also not as good as we wished. And because in our previous job with Kevin, we did a lot of web scraping, we knew we could build something similar. And so we did it. Like we had a few weeks of runway because pricing bot hadn't been sold yet. And so we had to act fast and we were like, okay, we're developers, we know web scraping. Kevin has a web scraping blog. Let's build a web scraping API. Don't think too much about it and see how it goes. Yeah, nice. And so when did you start to build it and get your first customers? Talk me through all that, Pierre. Yeah, so I think in May 2019, we see that our competitors' blog and SEO 
is not very good and we're sure we can do better. We build a beta in two weeks. We opened the beta for one month. We got some free users from um, gross hacking forums and web scraping forums, especially one big French gross hacking forums where we said, yeah, we're building with this web scraping API. It's free for now. Would you like to test it? Uh, after a month, we sent an email. Okay. You can keep using the product, but you need to pay. First plan at that time was $9 per month. And that's how we got our first user. It, it, it took the $29 plan, the first one. I can remember it. Okay. It was scraping Instagram wedding <laughs> profile. I love it. And uh, 1 million ARR in two years, Pierre, yeah. is no mean feat. That is bloody amazing. But how did you do it? Well, how did you grow so quickly? Are you surprised with how quickly it grew after not quite getting that traction with pricing bot? The first year was actually very slow. So yeah. for the first three months, we were below $1,000 MRR. Mm. After six months, we were probably at four, five. And after a year, we were at eight. But we knew we had a scalable acquisition channel, SEO. We had time. First, partly because we raised some money from TinySeed, but we did the math. We didn't pay ourselves a big salary. And we were able to wait, yeah, one year, two years before reaching 10K MRR. And things really started to accelerate after a year, a year and a half. We doubled down on content. The content we wrote started to rank faster. We also improved a lot the product, the onboarding, the documentation, and all of these combined and compound. Compounding is a very interesting and powerful force for bootstrappers and indie hackers if they keep showing up every day and making good quality content regularly. And as you say, it's a channel for you that has been scalable. Another thing you mentioned, Pierre, is the tiny seed funding. I've seen this with more and more founders, bootstrap founders, who yeah. have decided that tiny seed funding is a good option for them because it releases a bit of the pressure that they have from trying to make money. Exactly. I think the first reason was that we were a huge fan of Rob Whaling and what he built. And we really liked the idea to have this bootstrapper friendly fund. And secondly, we, we needed help. Kevin and I, we didn't know a lot of people in this startup, indie hacker, SaaS mm -hmm. industry, whatever. We're coming from a very small town and we knew it, it would be a big plus for us to have access to all those experts on those various fields. Honestly, the money was not the, the number one reason we applied. Actually, we never really touch the tiny seed money. Like we still have it on the <laughs> bank account. It, it was nice for the ad. It definitely reduced the amount of stress we had, especially because we got in tiny seed just before the first lockdown. And so mm. no one knew about anything. No one knew what's really where it's supposed to happen. So yeah, it was a big, yeah, big anti-stress thing now pierre i end every episode on three recommendations a book a podcast and an indie hacker or entrepreneur you're inspired by a book uh, i advise people to read hello startup by uh yevgeny brinkman especially if you're a developer yeah show you everything you need to know before building a startup from like load testing to marketing mm -hmm. to idea validation to support and all lots of actionable tips I don't listen that many podcasts, unfortunately. I love my first million, but I think yeah. everyone is <laughs> listening to it. I really like what Matt Wenzing is doing. Mm. Like he's building this uh, modeling tool called Use Summit. Wonderful recommendations. Thank you so much for joining me. See you soon. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Indie Buys. All links for everything discussed will be in the show notes as always. If you want to learn more about SEO, then check out today's sponsor, Ahrefs. And if you want to hear more from me and my journey, I have another weekly podcast called No More Mondays, which you'll find in all podcast players. All links are in the show notes. And I'll see you next week. Hold up. 